My name is Josh. I'm the worship and creative pastor here at The Exchange. Um, if you're just joining us, and just a quick update, we're in week three of a four-week sabbatical that uh, our pastor, lead pastor Bryant May, and his family are taking right now. Just to give you an update, I texted him just friend to friend the other day just to make sure he was still breathing and he was alive and all things were good. Um, all is well, man. He is being replenished and refreshed, man, just getting the fresh word from the Spirit uh, in what it is that God is leading us to into the next season of our Exchange family. So uh, we're in week three of of a series called Represent, uh, where we're really taking a deep dive into Second Timothy. And so I, I just want to start, man, we've all probably heard there's a line in um, the movie A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholas's character, he kind of emphatically shouts, you can't handle the truth, right? Like, been there? You've probably done that, like you've done your own bad impersonation like I just did. You've, you've been there and had that moment, maybe not fully knowing the context of what it was that you were doing in that moment. Um, there, there is a greater story being told in the interaction that is happening between the two characters in that scene. And really what he's saying when he emphatically shouts, you can't handle the truth, is he is telling the other character that he's engaging with that there is more to this story than people probably care to know. And there's more to this story than people are probably willing to commit themselves to. And so as we continue our journey into 2 Timothy today, and as Paul begins to speak to Timothy, his apprentice in the faith, I think he is asking Timothy the question, and I think he's asking the question of us today, can you handle the truth? Um, you know, Matthew opened the scriptures for us last week as we opened up chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, and we, we took a moment to, to pause and reflect and remember our reliability and our qualifications as hearers of the word. So I'm, I'm going to ask us to do the same thing today. I'll remind us what the scripture says. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it says this. You then, my son, Paul talking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And there's a progression that you see here. You see Paul to Timothy and Timothy to reliable people and then reliable people to others. And I just wonder, have you ever stopped and asked yourself how the gospel got to you? How did the gospel make its way to you? And at its best, it is reliable person to reliable person sharing a truth from generation to generation. At its best, it is a hungry soul that is satisfied by the nourishment of the Savior and then willingly disperses that nourishment out to other hungry hearts. But we know that people often get in the way of that, and that's not the perfect picture that we would hope to see because people, right? Anybody got a people problem in the room? Like you understand that people can be a problem. You're not admitting it right now, but I see a grin on a face or two. You're going to experience it at Thanksgiving. So just go ahead and just own it. You know you got a people problem. So here's the thing. So if, if people are a problem, then you would, you would know this because the church is full of people that the church has had its own problems for a long, long time, right? Uh, literally since the beginning. In, in fact, God created the garden and perfection, and before we got to chapter 3, man screwed it up, right? So we, we messed it up. Much like Jesus came, and he came to be the fulfillment of the prophecy. We just sang about it in the song, King of Kings. He came, and he walked the face of the planet. He, he was this faith personified. He was this new way to access the Father. He came, and he lived, and he died, and he rose again, and then he ascended to heaven, and then people messed it up, Right? So it is no secret that there has been a problem from the beginning of time. So let me, let me just give you like a timeline for a second, just so you can really understand where we are in the context of history. So if we're talking about Paul, then we know that through his conversion experience in Acts, that Paul was converted to Christianity somewhere in the range of four to seven years after the crucifixion of Jesus, meaning that Jesus hung on the cross, and within four to seven years, Paul was made aware of this truth and surrendered himself to it. And then at the point that he's writing this letter to Timothy, he has now been active in the faith for about 32 years. So simple math would tell us that we are less than 40 years removed from physical Jesus walking on a physical planet, dying a physical death. And in one generation, the church has problems. We've already begun to mess things up. And so just expand that and say, okay, so that was a problem within one generation removed. Now compound that another 2,000 years, right? 
and, and let's go ahead and throw in a hyper advancement in technology and then a hyper focus on individuality. And let's just say that the church has big problems, right? Welcome to the exchange. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> With that grim picture painted, let's dive into scripture today. Okay. Here's the deal. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and Paul is instructing Timothy in how to protect the purity and the purpose of the gospel. Specifically for our conversation today, we're going to lean into the ancient problem and the still current problem of false teachers and false teaching, okay? So we're going to define some terms. What is a false teacher? And I think just to be consistent, and words are going to talk a lot today. These aren't going to be Josh's ideas. We're going to do a lot of scripture today, so we're going to dance around a lot. But I think Paul's words in his first letter to Timothy serve as a great place for us to define the term, what is a false teacher? So we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is verses 3 through 5. It says this, if anyone teaches otherwise, meaning they teach a conflicting doctrine, and you say, what is a doctrine? Well, it's just simply a set of beliefs. So if they teach a conflicting set of beliefs that does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means to financial gain. A lot there. A lot of detail there. So we could maybe summarize that to say that, that a false teacher is someone who is spreading a set of beliefs contrary to those agreed upon beliefs and truths of scripture, and at its worst, someone who is doing that for their own personal gain, whether that be financial or for other personal purposes. So we look at our passage, we spend some time around the immediate issue that Paul is calling Timothy to deal with, and then today we're just going to expand that out, and we're going to say, what is our responsibility with the truth, as Paul was giving Timothy his responsibility with the truth. What is our responsibility? So we go back to the text. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. It says this. It says, keep reminding God's people of these things. So I will keep reminding you as God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. That's not a good thing. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth and they say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Rarely in the history of the church has heresy walked itself into the room, flung the doors open, beat itself on the chest, and declared from the top of its lungs, I'm here, I'm heretical teaching. That's not how it happens. Typically, someone takes the prism and turns it one degree, and in the turning of the prism one degree, they become hyper-focused on the one degree that they have turned their attention to, and then that automatically becomes the main thing. And so we're in this, this moment of history where heresy is a problem. And the reality is we don't know that much about Hymenaeus, except that he seems to be a recurring problem because he, always, he also gets a shout out in 1 Timothy um, when Timothy is talking about false teaching. So I'm just going to tell you, don't be that guy. Um, and then second, we don't really know that much about Philetus either, except for a context clue that we get in verse 18 when Paul says, they say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. See, Paul identifies the nature of their heresy as an early form of Gnosticism, and just for a working definition of Gnosticism, it is a belief with a central idea that the spirit, like the, the innate nature of human, is entirely good, and the matter, the bones and the skin and the things that make us up are entirely evil, and so therefore they separate the two. So these men begin teaching that a spiritual resurrection has taken place, but they begin to negate, they begin to turn away from the idea of a physical resurrection of Jesus, which speaks against documented proof and eyewitness accounts of Jesus appearing post-resurrection. Uh, there's at least 12 documented in Scripture. He appeared to as many as 500 people at one time post-resurrection. 
And because their view of the physical body is evil, it just makes it very dissatisfying to them that a physical resurrection would take place. So they do what most people do when they're uncomfortable with something. They just alter it a little bit so that they can become more comfortable with it. So you just begin to not teach that thing anymore. And so for Paul, the issue is that they're destroying the faith of some because in teaching that the resurrection has already occurred, it's just one degree removed that they could negate or deny the physical resurrection of Jesus and also no longer speak of the resurrection of believers to come in Christ's second return. So Paul gives a very direct response to this exact form of false teaching. It's in a different letter that he wrote to a different church. So it wasn't just an Ephesus thing. It was an everywhere thing. Um, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, here go the dominoes, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witness. So if what you're saying is true, then you're not the false teacher. I'm the false teacher. Because if that is true, we have taught these things about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, those who have gone before us, those who have died in Christ, they're now lost. Because if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Those are piercing words to wrestle with. Because if that's, if that's not true, then all of this is pointless. The songs you sang, the hands you raise, the words you hear right now, the responses that you'll make, it has no purpose if that is not true. And I'll just be honest and say, y'all, I fought internally over the last few days as I've sat with this message, and, and how am I to take these convictions that Paul is, is expressing to Timothy in, in owning the truth and defending the truth with, with valor and dignity and, and virtue and, and call us, compel us to do the same? And, and I think as, as I sat with the convictions, it's like, okay, so there's this specific church with a specific problem with some specific people and Paul has some very specific convictions about them. How can those convictions relay and apply to us 2,000 years later in a church in Pearl, Mississippi called The Exchange? And as I wrestled with the text, I began to see just a flow of thought that Paul is beginning to communicate. And I think it leads to some questions that we have to answer, that we have to identify together. So we'll walk the progression. Paul said in Chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 14, he says, Guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Obviously, he's speaking to defenders of the truth, people who would say that they walk in and, and give their lives to the truth. Then he progresses that thought, and he says this in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, which would be in direct contradiction to the very false teachers that he is, he is talking against in this moment. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. And then in our text today, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do your best, meaning make haste, be, be zealous, be, be eager to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed because they're confident, they put in the work, they put in the time, they know that their craft and their skill is good because they've committed themselves to it. And who correctly handles, means literally just means guides in a straight path, the truth. And I'm going to just let you into my brain for a second. I don't know if it does this for you, but for me, I read scripture. Does it ever just have you pause and ask yourself compelling questions? Like just, just in those three passages of Scripture, like what, what is the good deposit that Paul's talking about? What, what is the gospel that Paul believes? Why is he willing to die for it? Is Paul's gospel my gospel? What do I believe? Is, is my truth his truth? Is my truth your truth? Is our truth the truth? 
Welcome to my brain. Um, <laughs> but it just begs the question that I think we have to lean into an answer today. And, and I think for us, we, we take a deep breath and we have to go backwards to go forwards. So let's, let's revisit the foundation of who we are called to be as people of God. Okay? I would say this, as a devoted follower of Jesus, we are called to be ministers. And maybe that sounds vaguely familiar to you, and it should because it was literally the first point of week one of this series that Tim made. We are called to be ministers. But what, is, what, is that, what does that mean? If it was applicable in week one, then it's still applicable in week three because this is actually just one big letter, not necessarily divided into chapters. And so let's just, let's just pause there for a second. If we, if we are ministers and we're talking about week one, let's go back to week one for just a second. If you weren't here, I'll give you a recap. We talked about fanning the flame, t- taking the spark and the spark becoming a, a fire. And we talked about the essential parts of that, that fire that construct what it is that God wants to do in us. And we said that we would, man, really lean into and rely on the log that is time with God through his word. And we would lean into the log that is time with God through prayer. And then we would have the log of living it out. And so I'm just asking, like, how, how is that going for you? You'll remember Tim gave us a, a, a take-home reminder. He gave us this, this piece of wood as a reminder of the thing that we said that we would commit ourselves to. We came and we literally laid them on the altar and then we took one home. And I'm just curious, like, does this symbolic piece of wood, does it actually represent the thing that you said you would devote yourself to, that you would commit yourself to? Is this a, is this a reality in your life? And maybe you would say, hey, the, the, the flame is dim for me today. And can I just go, like, can I offer some hope and just tell you that there, there is an opportunity to take heart because if you're in Christ and you are truly a minister, and for our purposes today, we're just going to kind of pivot that word just a little bit. We're going to use Old Testament language and say that you are a priest. You are a priest and you have a job to do. So you are a priest and you have a job to do. And I've been reading a book that's called How to Worship a King by Zach Neese, and it identifies through scripture the, the responsibility and the history of the priesthood. And so I just want to invite you into some of the things that I'm learning right now. Uh, We'll start just foundationally. Exodus 19, 5 and 6, it says this. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Did you know that God never intended that the ranks of the priesthood be confined to one family line from one tribe, but he actually released that blessing to the entire nation of Israel, that they would be a nation full of priests that would lead the whole world in what it meant to worship God? Remember how I told you people are a problem? People are a problem. So no different in the Old Testament. Long story short, God, God's people begin to worship idols. And in choosing to worship idols, they choose to reject the offering of God to be priests. They, they choose to reject their role because they chose something lesser than. So quick history in the priesthood. Um, this is man-made, not God-made. But uh, very early on, it was only Jews that could be priests. And then after what we're talking about here, where things began to fall apart, it was only Levites from the lineage of Aaron's family that could be priests. And then somewhere in history, the Roman Catholic Church said, you know what? We're the only people that can ordain priests. And then as denominations began to pop up all over the world, they just followed suit and said, you know what? Like, we're just going to start calling people priests. And the reality is, as history has progressed itself, the distance between the stage and the seats has only widened, but I just need to tell you today that that is a, that is a man-made distance. That, that is not a godly distance, okay? So then the question becomes, how, how then did you become a priest? Well, as soon as you accepted this salvation that was uh, offered to you, you've been adopted into the family of God. So you were, you were born into, or we could say you were reborn into priesthood. And I can back that up with New Testament scripture that says 1 Peter 2.5. It says this, 
You also are like living stones. You are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So who is Peter talking to? He was talking to, to Christians. And if he was talking to Christians, he's talking to people that are committed to the way and the teaching of Jesus, that, that lean in heavily to that idea. And so if that, is, if that is you, then God made you to be a part of something that he is building. He made you to be a part of the church, his church, his people. And he gave you a purpose in that. He called you to be a priest within that church because you have a function of offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And then Peter doubles down on it in verse 9. He says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And you know, like I know, that verse is packed full. So you, you were chosen, but not just chosen, you were chosen to be a priest, and not just chosen to be a priest, but chosen to be a royal priest of a holy nation, and he gave you great purpose and intention in giving you that role, and that is to declare the praises of the God who saved you and set you free. So we determine our identity, we are priests, we understand that there is a job to do, so what is that responsibility? Um, there's an Old Testament story. Um, I think I shared a little bit of some of my readings about David and ultimately him becoming king. But if you, if you read in the Old Testament scriptures, there's a story where the Ark of the Covenant had been surrendered and taken uh, by the Philistines. And I mean, God's, God was just like not satisfied with that at all. And so he began to send plagues on any place that the Ark went. And so ultimately, literally the Philistines like put it on a cart and just let an ox carry it back into the land of the Israelites because they're like, we don't want that anymore. We're giving it back to you. So fast forward in that story as it found different homes for different periods of time. And there's a place in scripture where David is getting ready to throw a party for the return of the Ark to its rightful place. And so they are beginning to carry the cart in, to, uh, the ark in on a brand new cart with a strong ox. But somewhere along the way, the ox like loses his footing and the ark begins to fall. And there's this man, his name's Uzzah. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he had great intentions. He saw the ark begin to fall and he went to make sure it didn't hit the ground. So he reached out his hands to catch the ark. And the moment that he did is the moment that he died. And as you can imagine... David got mad, like that's kind of a bummer on the party that he was getting ready to throw, and he began to do his homework. And we'll fast forward the story to say, ultimately what you find in the scriptures is that the priest had made a foundational, fundamental error when preparing to move the ark. They tried to move the ark in the same way the world did it. The cart was the way that the Philistines moved the ark, not the way God's people had been instructed to move the ark. And here's the rub. See, the priest never told David that what he was doing was wrong because the reality is the priest didn't know that what David was doing was wrong because the priest didn't know the scriptures. The priest didn't know their job, and therefore they didn't do their job. And someone died as a result of the priest not knowing and doing their job. And I think there's two things that we can learn today as priests. The first lesson is this, that priests have no excuse for not knowing their responsibilities. As a priest, you have no excuse for not knowing your responsibilities. And there will be negative consequences when you don't know your responsibilities. The second lesson is this, just because something works for the world doesn't mean it will work for the church. I'll say that one more time. Just because something works for the world doesn't mean it will work for the church. Unfortunately, David had to learn this the hard way because God would, God would let the Philistines carry the ark on a cart because they were not worshipers of God, but he would not settle for the same disrespect of those who said that they were surrendered and followers of him. We know our identity to be a priest. We're aware of our responsibility to know the truth and share the truth and protect the truth, but that in and of itself begs the question, what is the truth, right? 
Reality is we all have a version of truth. I've literally been in so many conversations in my 10 years of ministry where someone literally talks about my truth or their truth, and I've just learned that the, the truth is in the middle somewhere because he's got a truth and she's got a truth, but there's the truth. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he issued the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and he, he gave two very clear, equally important instructions to the priests that were left on earth. He gave them the role of evangelism to share the truth, and he gave them the role of discipleship to know the truth. To share the truth and to know the truth. He says this in verse 19 of Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is evangelism. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That is discipleship. Sadly, in our Christian culture, we, we have severed the two over time. And we have put great importance on evangelism. And we have made discipleship kind of like the, the ugly stepchild, right? Like it's, it's, it's there and it's available. It's an optional extra for the people that are like really committed to Jesus, like really want to dig deep and really want to do the hard work. It's there for you if you want it. But that was never meant to be separated, and so here, here's what I'm asking, okay? Like, I'm, I'm going to ask for your charity today. I'm going to ask for grace today because I'm going to lean into something that might be a little uncomfortable for us. Um, but I'm just asking us to ask ourselves compelling questions, okay? There are multiple versions of truth that are communicated in American Western culture churches at any given moment. And I just want us to evaluate some of the ideas and principles of them and see where it is possible that we are mishandling the twofold call of role and responsibility. Okay? So, again, grace and charity. Okay? If you throw something, I'll throw it back. Okay? <laughs> All right. There is a version of the gospel that you've likely heard that sounds something like this You are a sinner going to hell. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And if you believe in him, you will go to heaven when you die. Amen. And I would say that the issue I have with that version of the gospel is less that it's wrong and just more that maybe it's too small and incomplete. I don't disagree with anything that is said there, but, but what if the goal of salvation was not about you getting to heaven, but allowing heaven to meet you here now? What if it was not about you magically going up there, but it was up there coming down here? I mean, what if it was less transactional and more transformational, right? Like beginning to lean into something that begins to allow God to do something in us where it's not just what he, what he would do for us, but it's actually what he would do in us. Because here, Here's the reality of this gospel, that apart from the discipleship, the devotion, and the spiritual disciplines... This can lead to sin management, like entry into heaven by the minimal requirements necessary, right? You may have heard it called fire insurance before. Like, it's just, just enough, right? Imagine if I was to go to my wife, and we had a yearly meeting where we sat across a desk from one another, and I asked her to sit down, and I said, babe, would you please just very clearly state the minimal requirements necessary for us to remain legally married for this next year? Just, just, no, 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 hear me out. Like, just the obligatory, just the contract, like, just the bare minimum. If you give me that, I promise you I will keep those. Don't hold your breath for much more than that. How's that working out for me? That's not working out for me, okay? But I fear that that is what is happening with this idea of the gospel because it, it emphasizes converts, but it begins to depreciate commitment to the call of what it is to bear fruit and to produce good works as, as a believer. Another popular position of the gospel goes something like this. God is perfect, he's holy, and he's just. He is a God of both love and wrath. You stand condemned and you're morally guilty before him. You owe a debt that you cannot pay. God's demands must be kept and his wrath satisfied, and you cannot possibly do it. But... Jesus did it for you on the cross. Praise God. And again, 
I don't disagree in any way with any of what is being stated there. The picture that God justifies those who believe through the work of the cross, literally taking them from this place of sin and injustice into this place of grace and justice is a beautiful picture. I have no problem with that picture whatsoever, but this view often has a tendency of placing a negative connotation around the idea of human effort. Paul talks a lot about good works. Jesus even talks about good works, and the works that Paul talks about, they are defined literally as self-effort, like just, just in general, like you just make effort. Like if I took a step, like there's an effort in me taking the step forward, right? But then we immediately, automatically equate that to earning. But I just need you to hear today that effort and earning are two different ideas, two different concepts. So don't join the two, but separate the two. Uh, A man by the name of Dallas Willard, he's quoted as saying, grace isn't opposed to effort, but he's opposed to earning. Grace isn't opposed to effort, but opposed to earning. So I would just say this, the, the work of the cross, finished and complete, what Jesus has done for us, grace cannot be earned. I, I will state that very clearly. You cannot earn grace. But, but your good works in response to your love for him that, that God has laid out for you to do, and I'll tell you in scripture where it literally says that that's what has happened, that takes effort. You have to be willing to engage that and now do something with the grace that you've received. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it unites these two concepts. It says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I fear in this idea of the gospel that a very passive form of Christianity is likely the result if we're only ever told what God has done for us, but we negate or we eliminate what our responsibility is with that truth, okay? They work hand in hand. They go together. So again, it's not wrong, but just maybe incomplete. There's a third gospel concept that's pretty prevalent in uh, the Western culture, um, particularly in America. It has a high view of prosperity. Um, It sounds something like this. God loves you. And he is for you. You're his child. And through his death and resurrection, he won the victory. And his victory is your inheritance by faith. It is victory over sickness and poverty and failure. The best is yet to come and your breakthrough is on the way. Wikipedia, because that's a reliable source, would define it this way. Uh, That was a joke, by the way. Um, It is a religious belief among some Protestant Christians that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Material and especially financial success is seen as a sign of divine favor. We're not going to hang here super long, but there's, there's like two camps of this prosperity gospel. There's hard prosperity and soft prosperity and Hard prosperity, for the most part, was pretty much disproven in like the 80s and 90s with a lot of like the televangelist style ministries. Maybe you saw a commercial for some Miracle Spring Water back in the day and asked you to spend, you know, send your $10 and we'll make sure God gives you a check for a thousand, that kind of stuff. Um, so we've kind of disproven that, but there's this other version, this, this soft prosperity version of the gospel that's actually probably more prevalent in churches across America today, and, and it sounds more like a, like a TED Talk or a pick-me-up than it does rightly dividing the straight path and walking out the truth of Scripture. And I'll just give you, I'll just give you a, like, I just thought this was an interesting fact. Well, I'll say this before I say that. To its credit, and you know, you, they're, all, again, all Gospels, like, they didn't come in saying, like, I'm wrong, <laughs> but they came in with an idea, and, and this Gospel it does, it does highlight, like it does shine the magnifying glass on generosity, which is the greatest picture of generosity was God's love for us through Jesus on the cross. Like it is there. But oftentimes what this gospel does is it begins to turn the lens away from the picture of what God has done. And it begins to try to communicate the gospel of what God has done through the very vices that are the thing that will destroy mankind, pride and money. Okay. So here's just an interesting fact that over half the churches in America that have more than 10,000 members preach a version of the prosperity gospel. 
do it that way, you will. And then this final gospel concept has been, it's been present for a long, long time, but maybe it's become a little more prominent here recently as, man, just unrest around social issues and perceived injustices in our culture continue to rise to the surface. I'm just going to read you a description of what I would just call the social gospel. The social gospel sees world history as a constant wrestle for power between the oppressed and the oppressor and views most relationships through the lens of power dynamics. In it, Jesus was a political revolutionary who came to liberate the marginalized and the poor from the hierarchy of oppression. And he was killed as a threat to the status quo of the empire of Rome, but he inaugurated a kingdom of peace and justice and equality. And now America is the latest iteration of a long line of empires, and Jesus will liberate the oppressed here as he has done throughout history, and the church will join him as his activists for the cause. And I lean in here to say, to its credit, like this gospel begins to help us see the marginalized, which is the very picture of Jesus. That's where he hung out and spent his time. But oftentimes, it gets skewed in the process, and the kingdom-minded purpose no longer becomes the purpose, but the agenda becomes the purpose. And as the agenda becomes the purpose, we begin to fight this ever-unquenchable goal. And so I say all those things to remind you that you have a priestly role that is twofold, that you would share the truth and you would know the truth. And I'm just, I'm just here to tell you, like, if, if you or your agenda sits at the center of the truth that you aim to protect, or if the truth that you claim and hold to requires little or nothing of you post the transactional moment of salvation, then I would have to question if the truth that you hold that should be a transformational working, constantly moving more to be like Christ, was an actual surrender to the truth of the gospel that we claim. Maybe you go, like, that's a lot to process, and i got to think about that for a minute. That's totally okay. But I'm just going to ask you to take heart today. E- even if that's difficult or that feels heavy for you today, take heart and hear that there is hope for Christ's church and there's hope for you. Okay? Paul shares this hope for us in 2 Timothy verse 19. He says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation, the church, stands firm. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In other other words, in, in, in spite of the heresy that exists from these two knuckleheads in the church in Ephesus, Timothy should be strengthened at heart to know that the church will stand, that all things will fall and fail, but one thing will stand, Christ's church. It has throughout history. Again, how did, how did the gospel get to you? And we go, man, times are bad now. I don't think you know history. Times have been real bad, but yet people who were reliable with the truth communicated that truth to other reliable people, and it made its way to your ears. There are two inscriptions sealed on the bride of Christ, one that stresses the safety of the bride of Christ, that the Lord knows those who are his. And the other inscription emphasizes our human responsibility that everyone who confesses the name of the Lord would turn away from. There is effort, action from wickedness. So I'm a one-point guy. I'm not a, not a three-point guy. So I'll just say, remember that you are a priest and that you have a job to do. 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, it continues. It says this, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. And some are for special purposes, and some are just for common use. Those who cleanse themselves, do do a little bit of effort and some work, from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So I'm just going to say that a, a refining work is not a magical work. And to be of noble use is a noble task to take on. There's a guy who's written a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. 
His name is Pete Scazzaro, and he talks about the intentionality that it takes, the effort that it takes. He says this. He says, we live in a blizzard, and few of us have a rope. Many of us have lost our way spiritually in the whiteout of the blizzard swirling around us. Blizzards begin when we say yes to too many things. Between demands from work and family, our lives fall somewhere between full and overflowing. I'm just here to give you a rope today. An identity that you can own and a responsibility that you can live out. You are a priest and you have a job to do. I'll just say this, your, your, your busyness is not a badge of honor. It's quite the opposite of that. It's actually just a band-aid on your brokenness. Um, and you've not allowed God to heal it because you've literally not given him the time or the space for him to heal it and make it whole. You're just numb at this point. You're just going through the existence of life. It's going really, really fast around you, and yet you feel just so isolated in the middle of it all. You feel overwhelmed. I'm just here to give you a rope. You have, you have a role and a responsibility to be devoted. It's going to take discipline. To be a priest in practice, it's going to take some effort. You're going to have to lean into the role and the responsibility that God has, has given you. If you are going to be a reliable person who can take a reliable word and hand it to someone else so that they can know the fruit of that word so that they can then go and take it to someone else, it's going to take effort. Um, you are not going to magically love Jesus more. You're not just going to wake up one day and accidentally pursue Jesus with your whole heart. It won't happen. You actually have to begin to kill the things that currently sit in his seat. And that takes a little bit of effort. So anything that I've said today, you're like, man, I'm really ready for Brian to get back. Like, I'm not, I don't want to listen to this dude anymore. I just want to say one, one thing. As, as I've sat with this idea, this flow of thought, and what, what it is that Paul is really trying to help us understand, I think it's this, that you're called to give this gospel all you've got because it's literally all you've got. Right. You're called to give the gospel all you've got because it's literally all you've got. Um, just say, like, like, this gospel, it's all I have. There is nothing exceptional or unique about me. I'm a 38-year-old man. I got a college degree in business administration. I worked six years at a furniture store before I took a ministry job. I didn't go to seminary. Nobody taught me how to open the word, read the word, teach the word. I just fully embraced that I would give myself wholly to the thing that I have already said that I'm wholly devoted to. And I'm just grateful for a lot of grace and a lot, and a lot of time and a lot of room because I'm a different person at 38 than I was at 28. Um, I'll just say this. So often we get to this place, this, this, this moment, and the salvation experience is, for many, many people, it is a very hyper-emotional experience. I mean, like, you, you feel it. It's tangible, and it's, and it's real. You know that God has done something in you. Far too often, we just stop there. Like, okay. Jesus, when you're ready to come back, I'm here, because I definitely want to go up there. But what if the call was to be something, a part of this existence that is greater than yourself that you could lean into? That you could be a reliable person, trustworthy, able to carry the truth. That maybe, maybe today you would just, you would just consider, can, can I, will I, Lean into the urging that Paul is calling Timothy to, and he's calling his church to, and he's calling us to. But you know what? I, I, I'm willing to suffer for that gospel. 
I'm willing to change the blizzard of my life and find clarity and find freedom in a way that Jesus is the center and the filter of every single thing. Here's the end of our verse. This flee an active action. The evil desires of youth saying grow up and pursue effort, righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Can I just interject myself and just say, stop it, that you would live for peace? Sometimes it's less about being right. It's more about, man, just being able to carry that gospel well. Because if you do that, you, you know that what you're doing, and this is why I say stop, because you know what you're doing produces quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, able, able to divide this word, not resentful, that they may share it with someone else. Why? Because you are a priest and you have a job to do. And it goes on to say this. Opponents must be gently instructed in, in, in the hope, in, in just the the maybe that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth the same truth that you hold dearly to and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will to Paul to Timothy Timothy to reliable people reliable people to others others to you, you, to who? The question, the question is, are, are you reliable? Are, are, are you qualified to carry this word? Can you handle the truth? And then ultimately, will you handle the truth? Is you're a priest and you have a job to do. Through the heartfelt letter of an imprisoned Paul, Timothy, along with all God's people, are presented with the reminder of the glorious privilege of representing God to others and the need to continue in this good work, even in the face of opposition. Faithful obedience to live sent in this life is the call. Paul reminds us through his letter of the great reward that awaits those who keep their focus fixed on Christ and persevere to the end. Timothy and we alike must not lose heart, though the world is broken and marred by sin. Jesus is the sufficient source of strength as we faithfully fulfill his purpose with this life. As you sit with the truth shared today, we would love to pray for and encourage you as you grow to know God and what it means to live in relationship with him. You can get the conversation started today by simply texting your first name to 601-397-6111. Our ministry team would love to pray for you and walk with you as you respond to God's grace. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as the church, let's speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.